Awesome. Well, thanks for having us. Um, so we are Dirty Diamonds. We've been friends since, what, seventh grade, where we met in Cartooning Club. So this has all sort of cyclically come back around where we are now doing comics as one of our big projects. Um, so we're going to walk you through sort of the history of Dirty Diamonds, how we established this project, why we just started doing it to begin with. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the work that we each individually do, and then we're going to dive into this Kickstarter campaign that we did this year and are still sort of doing. So <laughs> this is the issue that we put out using the Kickstarter. It's our fifth issue around comics. So we'll go a little bit deeper into what each of these books are about and the whole process behind this, but you can check out the lovely cover in the meantime. Also available for purchase at the end of the event. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So first of all, I'm going to talk about my work. Um, so I mainly work in autobiographical stories. Um, this is actually an example of one of my non-autobiographical stories. Um, this is one that I did for an event called 24-Hour Comic Day. It's a challenge that's done across the country uh, once a year where you try to create a 24-page book in 24 hours without planning ahead. Um, so I'm now, regrettably, the host of this event, so I'm <laughs> stuck uh, doing it every year. Um, the next one should be in December if anybody wants to check it out. Um, but this is just an example of something that I do. Um, one of my big projects last year was this book called Oh, The Things You Won't Know. Um, and it's what I like to describe as the more practical advice for a post-collegiate career, um, where it's mainly about the things you will not remember from your nights out. Um, so <laughs> this is sort of an example page where it's, it's a page-by-page -page parody of the original Dr. Seuss book. Um, and my current project is called Weird Me. And the premise of this, it's a true story, how I was the webmaster of a Weird Al Yankovic fan site when I was a teenager. So this is detailing all of my trials and tribulations of putting myself way too openly out on the internet around <laughs> the year like 2000. Um, so I have the first issue of this available and I'm working on the second issue now which is dealing with some of my concert experiences and getting closer and closer to meeting Weird Al himself. All right, and then we have Claire's work. So I'm Claire. Um, so I got my, um, that's not supposed to be the next one, but you get to enjoy that anyway. <laughs> um, I have my BFA in 2D Fine Arts with a minor in Art History. I have a studio in my home and then have a job, a real person job. Um, one of the things that I've done over the last couple of years is I'm a participating member in the Kensington Kinetic Sculpture Derby, which is a parade event in Kensington, Philadelphia. Um, yeah, that's what we should be looking at. So this is an example of my collage work, which is what I was initially trying to talk about. Um, so I take objects from the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and combine them with image from romance novels and 1960s pulp romance comics. Um, and then I do sculpture derby. So I'm a member of a team. We have won best costume three years in a row. So this is year one. We went as drag queens. This is year two. We were dragons. And this is year three. We were astronauts, <laughs> including cute little backpacks. <laughs> um, and then together, Kelly and I, as editors this year, have done an extensive amount of traveling. We were at TCAF in Toronto, uh, Canada. We were at SPX in Bethesda, Maryland. We were at MICE in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Asbury Park Comic Con in New Jersey. Also, Locust Moon Fest in Philadelphia, which was just this last weekend. And then we've participated in a couple panels as well. Uh, we did the Alien She panel through Vox Populi at the Crane Arts Building, uh, a panel around marketing and small press publishing at MICE, and then we were just recently featured on the Comics Alliance website for an interview we did with them at SPX. This is us at prom. <laughs> Yeah, there's going to be a theme of our unbridled enthusiasm just getting us really far. So this, this was born out of the Small Press Expo's uh, post-award ceremony party where they wanted to do a prom, and because we just seemed really stoked on that, they were like, why don't you be the prom committee? So this was sort of our baby in action. Oh, look, oh, look at how tiny. tiny it is. 
Thank you. Big. So this is a really significant picture in the history of Dirty Diamonds. This is actually the night before Dirty Diamonds was founded with its founding members. So the first issue of Dirty Diamonds was four girls, myself, Kelly, Carrie Peach, and Dre Gregoropel, who are all comic artists in Philadelphia. And um, this is an event called Drink and Draw Like a Lady, which is held in New York the night before... Um, Mocha Fest, Mocha, which is yeah. the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art. Um, so it's an event where basically any uh, woman in comics or you like comics or into comics all get together and we drink all the wine possible, eat all the cheese possible, and talk about comics all night. Um, so this n was kind of our first uh, moment where we realized that there was this huge community of women within comics that really weren't getting the level of representation that I personally thought that they deserved. I think it literally goes down, we were sitting in somebody's apartment after Mocha, like reading um, an anthology I'd picked up from someone who came out of Philly, and it had 75 guys and maybe two girls, and I was just done. And I, th I said to Kelly, I was like, we need to do our own anthology, it's time. Um, trying to see if there's anything I've missed, no. So one of the reasons that we started this with these two girls is we just decided that we wanted to see our work published together in some kind of a book and we wanted it to be artwork that we were interested in and with the idea of having autobiographical or what we call semi-autobiographical, we don't know how true any of this is, um, we also get a snippet of what these women's lives are like. So you're also getting to see more about these different artists and what's sort of important to them and significant to them around the different themes that we feature in each of the issues. Uh, so now we're going to kind of go into what it's like being an editor of this type of thing, which has a lot to do with sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the highlights of being an editor, is you get to eat food together while trying to figure things out. Um, so the way Dirty Diamonds generally plays out is we select a different theme for each issue. Um, these are the last four issues of Dirty Diamonds, so one, two, three, and four. Each issue has a different theme, so we've got alcohol, jobs, travel, and breakups. Um, and then what we do is we issue an open call, so we'll put a post on the internet saying that we are um, taking two to four page comics, semi-autobiographical, around whatever the central theme is for the issue, and then from there we collect the comics that come in from the women that apply. So from there, yeah, we review each of the submissions. When we're putting the book together, we're sort of looking at what kind of narrative we can be forming with the comics. So because we're asking for what we try to consider really, really general themes, we get a huge range of responses. So especially for the breakups issue, we were getting some that were kind of funny and we were getting some that were really reflective and others that were sort of sad. So it's, it's interesting to have to figure out how can you make this an interesting read from beginning to end for people that aren't in familiar with the majority of these artists. So that was a big challenge for us with our most recent issue because it tripled in size because of the submissions that we got. Um, so a lot of thought went into us laying out each and every one of the comics on a huge table and just sort of shuffling them around for about an hour, trying to see if this would be an interesting read from beginning to end and to let each of the comics themselves shine, because you don't want to have, you know, one comic be overshadowed by another. There's a lot of thought that goes into how do you make this sort of a curated experience. So once we've selected our comics, what happens then is we receive the finals from all the girls, so they, fit, they give us finished things, and then we have to do layouts, which literally involves uh, sitting in Photoshop and putting pages together in the correct order. Um, one of the things that's really interesting here is you can A, see the guides for us ac accounting for the bleeds on the pages. And then in addition, this is backwards. So this is page one, you can see here, and this is page four. But so if you fold them over. So through the printing process, you have to take this into account, especially with these, the first couple issues, since we did them with photocopying, not through, um, we didn't send them out to be printed. You have to consider what order you want the pages to appear in in the computer to get the correct finished piece. You have things like your table of contents pages and your credits pages. And so if you want to make a book, these are all things you have to put in your book. So we have artist bios, we have to figure out a cover, we have to figure out table of contents, like anything, page numbers. By the way, those are important. <laughs> um, but these are all things that you don't necessarily take into account when you're, you're you know, utilizing a book, but to have made one, you really need to make sure that these things are present. 
I will also preface all of this layout business with there's totally a program called InDesign that will do this for you. Um, I hate it, <laughs> so I still do this the old-fashioned way, and we are not above making little mock-ups of the books and making sure that we get everything squared away before we send out our final copies to be made. Yeah. Um, so once layout is done, then comes printing. So like I said, for the last four issues, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> We did photocopying, so it was us going to Kinko's, standing in front of a photocopier, spitting things out, folding everything down, and then binding the books ourselves. So it was a very, very, very hands-on, very labor-intensive process for the first four issues. For issue five, because we did a Kickstarter, we were able to ask people to contribute funds, and then through those funds, we were able to have the book printed. So we were able to send it to a printing location who then would print the books. They, they did a perfect binding. You can see that it's a large book too. It's eight and a half by 11. That's the size of a book. Um, when I came to shipping, I realized each one of them weighs about a pound also, which is stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it was great because we didn't have to worry about the night before the con being up in a hotel room folding and stapling books. Like it was like all these boxes showed up and it was like, oh look, it's done. <laughs> like, I didn't have to do that, that's great. Um, so then once the books are all printed and out and ready to go, we then have to get them into the hands of people. So a couple things that we've done in the past, we've done release parties for local Philly people. So everyone will come together, we'll do a raffle. It's always a good time. Um, and then we do a lot of tabling, which is what this is. If you ever come to one of our events, always look for the blue bunting. You will not miss us. <laughs> <laughs> um, we started tabling two years ago. In, yeah, in earnest. Yeah, we had kind of dabbled before very much locally in Philly, but now we definitely do a lot of travel. Like this year, that list I went through, it kind of covers a large distance up and down the East Coast and into Canada. So uh, these events are great. They're a really good way to not only just like meet your readers, but meet other people within the, the scene and in different scenes and in different cities in the same scene. And from there, you make friends and connections and people come to know both you and your book and your work. And it's really a great way for people to feel involved with you and then also feel a lot more compelled to continue to track what you do after whatever they've seen here. And now that we have this very subtle display that we bring around with us all over the place, people recognize our table. We're sort of becoming like a fixture. They'll see, oh, this is your little room here that you guys set up. And we'll always have you know, new stuff for them to see. And they expect to hear more and more about Dirty Diamonds. And then new girls will always come up to the table and we'll get them involved. And then we get a whole new breed of people involved in each issue, which is really exciting for us. Oh, and then the, the third girl there, the lovely brunette on the right-hand side, is Carrie Peach. She is our tabling third. She's with us everywhere we go. She's actually the uh, cover artist for the most recent issue as well. So it's really nice to work with her. She's great. We don't deserve her, but we take her everywhere. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to get into the meat of what Kickstarter was for us this year. So to kick this off, um, this was our original planning sheet when we were trying to timeline this whole thing out. So what we started with was what was our end goal for when we wanted to release the book? And what we decided is we wanted to have that um, happen at one of these tabling events. So we decided on one. We chose TCAF, which is the Toronto Comic and Arts Festival in Toronto, Canada, um, which was in the beginning of May. And we worked backwards from there. Uh, we started doing this planning in like February or so. Mm -hmm. So no, probably January because it's got one. Oh, it's Jesus. got January dates on it. This has been our whole year. We started <laughs> in January. It's October now. Um, so. We started in January, and you can see we worked backwards to make sure, okay, each Kickstarter campaign lasts no more than 30 days. Um, there's all kinds of analytics and articles and things that tell you do not do it longer than 30 days. You're sort of oversaturating yourself at that point. And we can go into more of the analytics later. Um, and then we wanted to give ourselves enough time to get the book prepared for printing and to actually get it printed and shipped to us, so that's at least another month. So there's a lot of working backwards to make sure that we're not driving ourselves crazy, that we actually have time to eat, sleep, and live our lives. Um, Optional. <laughs> this plan sort of worked. <laughs> um, once we did get the boxes, this is me in my hallway. It doesn't look much different. Um, it sort of saturates your life once you get all of your stuff that needs to go out from Kickstarter. 
So we can also show you Let's say show the, spreadsheet. the planning that goes into this. So we're a little bit manic, and we're really <laughs> obsessed. No, no. We're really good at what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I describe this as our beautiful mind style thought process, um, where we have this really intense shared Google Doc that tracks every single little part of our planning. So we'll show you a few examples of the sort of planning that went into this Kickstarter. Um, and this one was sort of costing out what rewards would actually get us money that would go towards printing the books and paying all of the artists and things like that. Um, so, you know, there's the thought of if we sell this many tote bags as a reward at this level, how much money do we actually make on that towards producing this object? So we have this really insane matrix. There's a lot of math. Um, there's also that we make it do for us. Right. We do not do the math. We don't trust ourselves. <laughs> yeah, no. um, one of the things that I feel like I definitely learned out of this Kickstarter experience is um, do as much pre-planning as possible. Like, and the more work you do in the front end, and I'm not saying to the point where you have to like box yourself into I can only make 15 of these, and like it's, you're gonna have to be a little like fluid and a little able to adjust as necessary. But the more thought we put into the beginning, the less thought we had to put in at the end. And that also gave us the ability to be very accountable for what we said that we would do. So when we said, like, hey, if we meet the stretch goal, we'll be able to print 100 more books, we knew that that would be true because we had already done the math and the thought process ahead of time. Oh, I guess I can show you our Kickstarter page here. Look, um, it's successful. It was successful. Um, so our original goal was to get $6,500, and we have a breakdown here of a video, some promotional stuff. Um, so this was our cost breakdown when we were doing the planning process to show people up front, this is what we're going to be spending the money on. Um, as you will see, absolutely none of this is for us, and that's completely the case right now. I think we're 50 cents over. Mm -hmm. 50 so we're cents in the right, right on budget. <laughs> um, so you'll see the majority of it goes towards the actual production of the book itself. This goes towards paying all the artists in our book because it was really important to us for this issue to treat all of these artists like professionals. And we wanted to show that we really do appreciate their contributions. They're the ones that make Dirty Diamonds as good as it is, so we really just want to show them the best treatment possible. Um, and then the amount that goes towards the production of the rewards and shipping, which is going to be its whole own topic. Um, <laughs> So what I'm going to be interested in doing at the end of this is seeing how close we actually were to this because we're going to be doing another one next year. But we try not to think about that right now. It's not, it's not a real thing yet. It's just an idea thing. So to show you some of the useful things that you get when you do a Kickstarter is they give you a boatload of analytics. Um, they give you this really scary graph at the beginning so you can see exactly how quickly you're making progress towards your goal. And you'll see that we hit our goal a couple weeks ahead of our deadline, which was awesome. Um, but then you'll see it sort of peters out and sort of continues to go up, and at the very end you get little, a little blitz there. Yeah, there's two really big spikes that happen in Kickstarter. It's right at the beginning, because you can see this jump is pretty significant, and then right at the end. It's people who like really want to get in there. We also found out something fun, which is once you hit your Kickstarter goal, people start to back out of your Kickstarter, and they can do that. So that's a really scary moment when you're like, wait, I, I had that money. That was going somewhere. Why are you going away? So I like to describe this as 30 days of hell, <laughs> where we just had this tab open in our browsers every single day, just checking it maniacally to see where we were at. Um, it's very alarming when you know you hit 35% in two days, and then you're like, hey, buddy, I just want to get to this mark. Um, but yeah, it's interesting when people start backing out of your campaign, and if you do a lot of research about it, you just have to realize you can't take it personally. Mm -hmm. It's what people, people want to support your campaign and get you to your, you hit the goal mark. And once you hit that mark, Kickstarter doesn't back out. You know, if you go under, like, you're going you're gonna to be okay once you hit your mark. Um, but people will back out to the point where you're like, oh, my goal is 6,500. We're at 66. They'll drop their $100 pledge, but you're still at your goal. So people kind of play with your emotions a little bit there. Um, it's okay. It happens to everyone, apparently. Um, but then, you know, if you, if you really advertise that you have stretch goals, and our stretch goals were we wanted to print more copies of the book and pay our artists more, um, that's a really good incentive for people to continue to support your campaign and get you to that higher mark. Um, so we were fortunate that we hit our stretch goal and didn't have to stress out that much.
What you do have to stress out about is the amount that Kickstarter and the credit card company takes out. So definitely consider the full like eight to ten percent that you would lose from your Kickstarter. It's a chunk too. You don't expect it to be a chunk, and then you're like, oh, it's gone. That was yeah. it. So other cool things you get to see is how many people found your project through different locations and what like their average pledges were. Um, you can see which of your rewards were the most popular. Uh, you can even see where people came from. So if they were referred from Twitter, you can be like, I'm just going to post on Twitter a lot because I'm getting lots of people donating, you know, $75 from Twitter. Um, and then you get an enormous number of updates about every single person's individual actions. So you feel a little creepy and a little stalkerish for a while. But it's really helpful that you have all of these resources as you're doing this project, um, just so you know what is the most effective way to then get your goal. It's also really nice when the Kickstarter's happening is you kind of have something to constantly be talking about with just about everybody. So we had a couple tabling events while the Kickstarter was in action, and it was a great opportunity for us to be like, check out our Kickstarter, get involved. Hey, we want to print this book. You want us to print this book. It would be great. Um, so... Having content to be able to share with people, having a mission, and having something that people can help get behind, I feel is a really good opportunity in those moments where you have someone face to face, and it also helps kind of further your name and further the level of involvement that people want to have with you in the long run. So you're not even just looking for people to give you $75 now, you want people to be willing to tell their friends to give you $75. So it's kind of like using your network and then getting your network to use their network and then getting that network to use another network and just like how many people can you get behind the same rally and cry. So for our timeline, we launched our Kickstarter around the beginning of April, and we actually scheduled that so we would have a few tabling events during that time that we could then really promote the Kickstarter. We met lots of other people doing Kickstarters. We met somebody from Kickstarter who was trying to feature different projects that he found at the show, and everyone's very supportive of each other's campaigns. Um, we had that run through sometime in April. It was like, it it was was like, like end of March to, to mid-April. Yeah, something yeah. like that. And then we had a TCAF. Um, really quickly afterwards. So what we ended up doing is we did a short print run to make sure that we had our books for the debut and then we did lots of edits because there are many um, unique qualities to the first print run. I won't call them mistakes. <laughs> um, they're rare now. Um, and then we got this like 18 box delivery to my poor apartment. Which it's about is about 650 bucks. Yeah. Most of which are packed up in more boxes now ready to go to the post office. Um, but we'll get there soon. Um, well, actually, it's time to get there now. Oh, great. So, oh, oh, and then also creating the reward thing. So, like, we screen, screen printed the tote bags, which are also available here. Aren't they really nice? Um, and that's a huge part of doing the Kickstarter is then you've got to go, you've got to get your buttons printed, you've got to get your postcards made. It's, like, not just committing to printing the book, it's also committing to give people the stuff that they wanted, which is why they got involved. Another big component, especially of this stage of a Kickstarter, is keeping all of your backers updated on what you're doing. Um, because as we said, this campaign ended around the end of April, beginning of May. It's now October. Um, so people want their stuff. And people are very, very nice to you on Kickstarter. It's they, They've given their money as a supportive measure. So it's you don't have to stress out too much about disappointing them or anything. They're very conscientious of the amount of work that's going into this. Um, so it's just really important, you know, send them little pictures like this to say, hey guys, we're working on this stuff for you, we're still so grateful for you, we wouldn't be able to make any of this without you. Um, so they're very appreciative if you just tell them, you know, this is the process, and they like to see sort of that insider knowledge of what's going on to make this product that they were so supportive of to begin with. Um, so here's some more of us just with gigantic stacks of books, like putting custom book plates into each of the books, which was a, a higher reward tier. Um, we have all of our beautiful buttons that got made for this. Um, this is just yes. a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the amount of shipping that we have loaded up in my apartment. Um, so it's <laughs> October now, and we are currently battling the United States Postal Service in order to be able to use their online uh, or shipping ordering thing because there's a discount if you use the online thing and it won't take our money. So we <laughs> want to give it our money, we want to ship things to people, but I've had two 35 minute phone calls as of right now with their tech support and no solutions. So we're hopeful but frustrated <laughs> and um, 
So we, we really wanted to be honest with you guys. It's like, yes, we did this Kickstarter. Yes, things have gone really well so far. But look, we are in October and we're still fighting the shipping game. So it is a big project and it is a large investment in your time. So, um, but honesty, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind when you're running a Kickstarter is just everyone really appreciates transparency. Like nobody really cares if you run into this kind of problem so long as you're just like, this is the problem that I ran into. Um, and people will take that to heart when they then themselves are interested in doing a Kickstarter. So all of this and all of the snags that we've hit, it's all lessons for us and we're now that much more capable of doing our following project. And it's kind of good to run into problems like this because now we're like, we're just not going to use the post office website again. <laughs> but we'll, you know, we'll duke this out. We'll make it work. It's going to happen. It's totally going to happen. We're we going to plan. Win. I mean, there's no other option. So. We're go-getters. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yeah, the overarching lesson of Kickstarter is you don't make any money. You use all of it. All of it. So don't have any grand ideas. This is going to pay your bills because it doesn't. Sorry. I think we even put a buffer in there, and I was like, great, that was the tax that got taken out of this. So... Uh, yeah. And then we wanted to finish with, this is the open call for issue six. So if you are a female comic creator or know any female comic creators, we are always looking for new girls to join the family. Please feel free to get involved. Follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Tumblr. There's lots of stuff to be had, and we always are excited for new friends. And if you ever need any information about Dirty Diamonds at all, we have a website, um, just dirtydiamonds.net. This has all the information about our open calls, about all the shows that we do, all of our social media, um, and our online store where you can also purchase the digital copies of our back issues, which are, for the most part, out of print. But yeah, yeah. that's sort of Dirty Diamonds in a nutshell, um, all of the trials and tribulations <laughs> we've had getting to this point, and look, we're still smiling about <laughs> it. Uh, so I think we're supposed to ask if there's any questions. So, back to the Kickstarter thing, how much did you know about Kickstarter before you got involved with it? Um, I mean, besides what everybody knows about Kickstarter. Yeah, like, I had backed projects, and um, knowing other publishers and creators that have used it for their projects, I've sort of had some knowledge from them. Um, and what I did when I was doing my part of the planning is I just started stalking all of the projects that I thought went really well, and I had crazy notebooks of just, I, like, I thought this was a really effective thing to do. Like the pie chart, totally not my idea. It was just something that I thought was a really useful and smart way to show, you know, this is how I'm planning to spend all this money that you are so graciously giving to me. Um, so I did a lot of research about what I thought was effective and what I thought was a good communication tactic from other people. So I think if it's something that appeals to you and is useful to you, other people will also generally find it useful. Other than that, it was just, oh, how does this actually work? And it's, it's fortunately a really user-friendly website, and the people that run the, the website are really helpful and friendly. Yeah. So you have help. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a question more about partnership. With, um, I'm a, what drew me here is I have content that would go really well in a graphic novel, but I have no uh, current confidence in how to partner with someone. I, I do not draw, and uh, but I, uh, I I write, uh, but not for comics. But my again, my material lends it. How would you say I might go about Twitter partnering? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's something to be said for just sort of trolling around on Tumblr or Twitter and seeing if there's an artist whose style you like or if they work in sort of the same genre that you work in. Um, and I've seen lots of people at the different shows that we go to go around to tables and say, hey, I'm a writer and I'm looking for an artist and I, I really like your work. Like, would we be able to get in touch after the show? And you just sort of see who you're interested in and who seems receptive to your ideas. And I've seen a lot of things come together that way. Also, don't shut yourself down in that, like, I don't draw thing. I've seen so many people make comics out of just stick figures or collage or whiteboard marker. It's just like, that's the beauty of comics is it's an incredibly accessible medium where your skill set grows the more you make. So don't say that you can't be the one to do it because you totally could. It's and not that hard. If we can do it, it's fine. And there's something <laughs> to be said for not sort of saving your, like, this is my big opus project for when you think you're ready for it. I, I'm totally in the mindset of just, you should gun it, you should just do it. Mm -hmm. And if you wanna have like some practice projects or something just to get yourself out there to get people familiar with you, that's also really useful. So doing things like that 24 hour comic day, 
Um, not that I recommend staying up for 24 <laughs> hours doing comics, but there's also like hourly comic day where you just make a comic, like, you know, two panels or something for every hour that you're awake just to sort of get yourself in the mindset of just <clears throat> making a visual story. So, so there's lots of ways that I think it's good for you to just, you know, just post things online, post, that just like share things with your friends and get feedback. Um, just anything that sort of gets you into that grind, that will always help you towards getting towards a point where, you know, you want to really attack the more challenging projects that you have lined up. Sure. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, I wish we had a really good answer for the why dirty diamonds. Uh, I think it just sort of erupted out of our collective mouths one yeah, day. Yeah, like it was that, that day I was talking about it. We were like, we have to do this. And we were like knocking around ideas. And our friend Dre was like, dirty diamonds. And I was just like, that's it. It, was just like, it just felt right. It was right. Found out way later it's an Alice Cooper album. But, you he know. He doesn't mind. He's, he's fine <laughs> with it. Um, <laughs> And then <coughs> conical graphic novels. Um, that's a little tough. I mean, there's like the obvious stuff, like everyone needs to read Blankets by Craig Thompson. Everyone needs to read Asterios Pollitt by David, oh god, I never know how to say his last name, like Mizuchizuchi. It's got like four Z's in it, I have no idea. Um, and then there's a really good anthology coming out right now, and they're doing it every two years. It's definitely for the 18 plus. It's called Smut Peddler. It's um, female-centric erotica, but it's beautiful comics. It's an excellent, they do a Kickstarter for it. It's a really well-run Kickstarter. It's a really good anthology. And the girl who runs it, Spike, is just an incredible girl. So she's like, that's always a project that it's like, look, you like Dirty Diamonds, Smut Peddler is a really good place to go to if you're comfortable with that type of thing. Yeah, that question is kind of hard for me to answer because there's such a wealth of stuff out there right now that I think it's hard to say, like, because there's, you know, so little out there, these are the ones that you have to make sure you read, sort of like, you know, staples in literature. Just right now there's so much experimental stuff going on and there's so many people doing so many different things, and especially women now becoming more prominent in comics. Um, that I think you're safe just diving in wherever you feel comfortable. So whatever, if you're into like science fiction, if you're into fantasy stuff, if you like even, you know, like spin-offs of cartoon shows that are on, like, there's just so much good work happening right now by all of these different artists, either professionals or indie comic artists with, you know, their part-time day jobs. There's just a lot of really, really good stuff out there. And I'll, I'll just always advocate for going to any of these local shows and just taking a look at who's out there and then just sort of, you know, following them online, seeing what they do, see who they're interested in. Um, and you get a lot of really good stuff out of that. When you do your next one, are you going to do Kickstarter again? We are going to do a Kickstarter. Um, we haven't quite envisioned what that's going to cover yet. Um, we have a general timeline from when we want to get the next issue out, and then we have, you know, like sort of a pipe dream three-year plan. Um, so we're figuring that all out yet, but yeah, the idea is that we will have another Kickstarter. Yeah. At some point. When so we're stay in touch. <laughs> we're going to need friends. You have friends that need to know about us. So, you know, just keep that when we mind. When we get past our, our post office trauma, <laughs> then we'll, we'll, have, we'll be way more confident about that. I have a studio in my home, so uh, there is an extra bedroom in my house that is mine, much to the bane of my husband's existence. <laughs> um, and it's where I work, so I don't, I make comics, but I make a wide variety of work, like I do the collages, and then I've been sewing a lot to the costume projects. Um, I'm often kind of the weird fish at these like comic events, because I'm like, yeah, I read comics, comics are cool, I like drawing, that sounds great. Um, but I, I do not have the level of knowledge and obsessiveness that can happen sometimes. Um, but everyone's always so great. Like, that's the thing. Like, these are, like, really solid people and really solid people making really good work. And they're so excited to meet us. And we're so excited to get to hang out with them. 
And it's just like I've never had a more supportive group of people be around, you know? Like nobody is ever salty about anything and it's just like everybody wants to draw together and everyone wants to do projects together and everyone wants to hang out and have a beer. It's just like, cool, let's all be best friends. This is great. <laughs> yeah, when I first got serious about comics in Philly, there's a group called the Philly Comics Jam that I got introduced to, which is, um, it's a really loose gathering of just local cartoonists. Like, there's, there's, you know, there were people like me who were just sort of starting out and then there's people like Box Brown, who's, you know, a New York Times bestseller. And we all just sort of hang out and we collaborate and we drink a lot and you know we get to all sort of see each other's creative process and sort of pick each other's brains and talk about what we like and what we hate in comics so what's great about comics is that the community building is super strong and i think that comes out of this mentality of like of these tabling events which totally are born out of like a zine fest mentality where it's just a bunch of tables everyone's got stuff stapled together and you just want to share um so people are really good about you know just collaborating and meeting each other and just being interested in what you're working on. Yeah. Uh, I've got this uh, crazy friend back home in Massachusetts, and we both thought it would be a wonderful idea to just make a graphic novel, just kind of out of the blue. And we're about 10 pages into it. Um, he draws. I don't draw. Uh, I might start drawing because I'm getting frustrated. But he gets really frustrated because he doesn't, he doesn't think that he's um, a good enough artist to pull it off. Um, what should I tell him to make him draw more? <laughs> draw more. Uh, <laughs> just, just tell him to do it. I think there's some, there's so much to be said for just keeping up a diligent practice. Mm -hmm. um, like for the first volume of my Weird Al book, I sat down for about a month and a half and I churned the whole thing out. Um, that sucked, but I, I was just being, I was being very productive and I was just in a very good mental space at that point where I was creating not healthy habits, but effective work practices that I'm now using on my second book. Um, but it's it's good to just keep yourself sort of diligent and just have, you know, like this is the two hours that I'm going to sit down today and make sure that I work, whether it's laying panels out or doing the actual drawing or inking or scanning, just doing some part of the process. Just so you got to treat it like a job where it's it's got to be like a dedicated time where the TV's off, your computer's not in your face because Facebook is really tempting, even if you're looking up references or whatever. Um, but just being in the practice of doing work is going to get you to be better at your work. So tell them to suck it up and just do it. <laughs> I would also say a, a graphic novel is a huge undertaking. So it's like the maximum number of pages of a book I've ever done is like 30. And I like kind of wanted to die by the time it was over. <laughs> Um, so I would say if you can take a really large thing and break it up into smaller chunks that you then take each small chunk and go the whole way through the process. So go all the way from like scripting to pencils to drawing to inks to layouts to printing to stapling to binding to a finished product. Because every time you see that I made a thing, I've finished a thing, the next one is far less intimidating and um, you learn so much being able to see the finished product and to really understand storytelling and through comics when it's in your hand than when it's like just drawings tacked on a wall or um, you know in your computer it's it really holding a finished product I feel is really helpful in wanting to make another finished product. Excellent. Sure. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think we're supposed to draw. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you guys want us to draw something? Sure. Sure. What are we supposed to draw pictures of? Yeah, we didn't know um, what you guys would be interested in, so... Oh, uh, like, wait, what were we thinking of? We could do... We could do a jam comic. We could do... Oh, we could show you guys how we kind of build a layout, so you can kind of get an idea as to how that works visually, or you can just tell us to do something. <laughs> I'm the nut trying to do a graphic novel, so watching you do a setup would be pretty easy. Yeah, sure. Uh, here. You wanna this is so pretty, whoever did this, oh. thank you. Oh. But I'm gonna erase it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> here, Kelly, you wanna show a layout? Oh sure. I can even pull it up in Photoshop if that's To the fourth issue.
It's so big. It's so sad. Um, so the essential part of making a layout is Mm. You want to know how big your finished book is, so if you want it to be this big, you're going to have to get 11 by 17 paper that then folds down to this finished size. This is folded down from a regular sheet of paper, so it's way more manageable. Um, recommend that. Um, but we have a better one coming. Oh, good. <laughs> I was to say, can you see that? Because I can't see it. <laughs> I'll show you my Photoshop stuff. Uh, so this is like how I set up um, a file where I've got, you know, this, this is an 11 by 17, but it's the same principle for an 8.5 by 11 sheet, um, where you just find your center and then you find your quarter inch <coughs> margins because that's the closest you're going to be able to get to the edge of the page without going full bleed, um, which is going to cost you a buck and a leg. Um, so what you do is you just, you know, you find these little gutters to make sure that you're not going to get stuff lost in the, the inside edges of your page, unless you want it to look like sort of an edge bleed. Um, just be intentional about that. Don't let things just get lost in there. Um, and then down here, we sort of demark where our, um, our page numbers go, just so we have, you know, some consistency there. Um, and I can't get it to come up on this screen, but I have a ridiculous mess of layers that I use to keep track of everything. Um, so what I recommend more than anything in Photoshop is just naming your layers. Ooh. Because that's the best way to be nice to yourself. <laughs> you don't want to be trying to find things and be like, Ugh, uh, what did I name this thing, you know, three weeks ago. But look what I got. <laughs> Aren't you fancy? Yeah. Uh, there's also two different ways you can do layouts. So for, so this is like the one she was just talking about. Like it's one piece of 11 by 17 paper, and then you split in half to do the two eight and a half by 11 pages. But there's also like for five, what we did is it's a single sheet. So this is like a single piece of paper that we had to do them in order. So remember when I showed you this one, and it was like this is page 40 and this is page one and you have to like do them kind of in, re in a uh, reverse order based off of a mock-up. Um, when we sent it out to the printers, we just needed to do one page and then it was page two to page three, page four, and then they're the ones who like print it on each individual sheet. And then for that, you also make sure you do the quarter inch margins. One of the unique quirks, not mistakes, of the first print run was um, you want to make sure that you're mindful of, even though you're giving them a file of this is page one, page two, page three, where it's actually going to lay in the book. So is it on the left side or is it on the right side so that you don't end up with, you know, I have a different color. Select your favorite. <laughs> so say this is your whole book. You don't want to end up with, you know, you're having nice little page numbers on the outside and then you go, and then you have everything sort of lined up really close to this edge, and you should have just snuck it over a little bit to that edge. So just like little things that you want to make sure that it's, it, you're making an easy, natural reading experience for people. Because any little thing like that will take someone out of your book, and you want them to just sit there and go cover to cover and be amazed by how great and talented you are. And then the thing to also know is if you ever want to print bleed, like if you ever want something to go all the way to the edge of a piece of paper, it's actually a different layout process. Like, because what you actually have to do is you have to make your um, piece of, like your I image in uh, Photoshop larger. Because basically what they're going to do is they're going to print it on a larger piece of paper and then they're going to cut that piece of paper down to the point where your bleed will be. So often if you're using a printer and they want and you want to do a bleed, they will have layouts available or they'll tell you how they want you to set up a bleed layout because there has to be this extra space in there. Yeah, you can see it here. Yeah, and if you're really smart, you'll actually design your image so it goes to that extra edge. I was not smart here and I just put in, you know, some some filler color. Um, but that's just so they have this little extra space is what they call the trim. So that's where they actually will cut the paper. And that's about um, an eighth of an inch. And an eighth of an inch further in from there is the safety. Um, and that's where there could be wiggle room where this gigantic guillotine is going to chop mm -hmm. your paper. Um, so they say anything important on your page, like this little text here, I make sure is well within the safety. Otherwise, you're going to get some ugly covers. Special covers. Special <laughs> covers. Never mistakes. <laughs> Learning opportunities. 
Um, yeah, that's that's essentially it for layouts. Uh, if I had a piece of paper to rip up, I would show you like the dumb way that we do <laughs> little mock-ups of books. But um, there's, everyone has their own way of figuring out, you know, like this is the exact way you need to lay out my file. Um, because something like this, I can't get the layers to pull up. But, oh, That looks great. Yeah, this is a book ready to go. <laughs> but you know, it, everyone has their own way of figuring out, you know, like this is where page 40 and page one need to go so that when you fold it all together and you don't screw up at all, it just comes together like a perfect, wonderful book. Also, you can tell a photocopier to print double-sided. You don't have to, like, pull stuff out of drawers and put it back in. And that was, that was a discovery around, like, issue four, and we were like, ah, right. You come from a DIY mindset, and you realize you don't actually have to do it all yourself. It's a computer and a photocopier. It's People have needed to do these things before. So there's lots of really good resources. Again, InDesign is a really good book-building tool. You just got to be able to make sure that you can print directly from InDesign. Otherwise, you're going to have a really fun time exporting your file so that it is actually a book file, which is why I hate it. And I just do everything <laughs> myself. Did you figure that out? I figured out that you can't do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you guys just jumped into Photoshop and Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop. Mm -hmm. It's a lot cheaper. So there's that. Um, and then we had both individually uh, photocopied and stapled, like xenified comics we had done at that point. Like prior to starting Dirty Diamonds was mm -hmm. the first uh, was Pack, Pack. right? Mm -hmm. So that was the Philadelphia Alternative Comic Con, which is not a thing anymore. Um, but we tabled it that with like I had a bunch of one page books. She had some cute little books she had done like in uh, you did the little stitch binding with mm -hmm. it. Um, so we had both self-published things before so then taking that knowledge into okay well we're gonna do this with other people's comics as well um, yeah we did um, earlier this month we did a panel up in Boston that we talked about which was all around um, marketing and self-publishing um, especially around small press distributors like we are um, and we talked a little bit about how self-publishing sort of necessitated itself in comics because for so long it was just big publishers like Marvel and DC and even smaller ones like Image or whatever. Um, so people would see these things, they would be so inaccessible to a large variety of artists, especially if you wanted to work on something of your own rather than these licensed characters or these different properties. Um, that people just sort of turned around and said, you know what, I'm just going to do it myself, or we're going to form a little collective and do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that has just exploded beyond belief within the last, however, I mean, probably the last decade or so. Yeah, I mean, even the more the internet develops and the more, like, printing technology just becomes more and more accessible and cheaper, it's like the more stuff people publish. Yeah, and, like, the proliferation of web comics also has yeah. made comic publishing a completely different game. Um, so there are people who you know, have millions of readers and they don't spend a dime on printing. But then, you know, they can also turn that around and they can put together a collection of their comics and then sell that to the same people that were then otherwise getting their content for free. And that's one way that these readers then show their support for these artists and are sort of encouraging them to keep making this property that they really like. Um, so I think there's a lot of just do-it-yourself, if I want to make work, I'm the one who's responsible for getting it out there mentality going on in comics. Yeah. Building off the economics issue, I, you mentioned some of the, the bigger firms. I know now they're experimenting with doing buy the issue online and it's sort of like block PDF you pay and they send it to you. Has there been any movement in the DIY community, you think, to have sort of digitized comics of that sort? Of yeah, and we definitely we work do, with that. Yeah, we do digital editions. Uh, I know a lot of artists use Gumroad, which is a very popular digital distribution s system. Um, Digital's great because it's incredibly easy and very cheap and very accessible, but I still mourn not having a thing in my hand, you know? Like, don't get me wrong, I got an e-reader and I love it, but I still, I want to have that comic in front of me, I want to be able to, like, do the tactile page turning, and then there's also something about it as reference material, like looking at material on a computer as reference material versus having an open book in front of you. I feel are very different things and you gain very different pieces of information from them. Yeah, along that thought though, there is something to be said for you can only get your physical stuff so far. Like for us, it's however far we're willing to travel and people meet us at these shows, we can then get the books out to them. 
But if we're, we, what we do is we offer digital copies of all of our back issues because they're no longer in print, and these can go literally anywhere within however long it takes me to send an email. Um, and sites like Gumroad also let you offer your books to people at a price that they're willing to pay. So you can set it up so that, say, you want to sell your book for $2, but if somebody wants to give you $4, that'd be really cool. So they, they allow you to set it up so it's 2 plus, and it's a way for them to show a little extra support for you as a digital artist. Um, so there are a lot of avenues for publishing your work digitally, and I think there's so much precedent for it now, especially because of how popular and how widely distributed web comics are. Mm -hmm. So people sort of expect to find comics on the internet right now. Um, and there's something to be said, like, people are actually very respectful of your digital property when you send it to them. Like, you'll, they'll get it and you don't worry like, oh, nobody's going to buy my stuff anymore because I sent this one file out. People are really good about it. They do want to support you as an artist. And because digital stuff doesn't really cost you anything to distribute, most artists are pretty smart about how much they charge for those things. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's still sort of something that's stabilizing and there are other things like um, like a Patreon, um, which is like a subscription, it's like a support subscription that you have for an artist or for a webcomic where people can set it up and you have like a monthly contribution that you then pay towards this artist and that supports their ability to have a webcomic. Um, so there's a lot of online resources for distribution and for getting paid as a comic book artist.